Late 2013, across Eastern Europe and beyond, banks began seeing strange account activity that didn't quite add up. Within months, ATMs in some places were observed dispensing cash with no customer present, no cards inserted, no PIN codes entered, no authorization from any legitimate account holder. Men with suitcases would appear at each machine, collecting the bills with practiced efficiency before disappearing into the night. This wasn't a glitch in the system or some banking error that would be corrected in the morning. It was the beginning of the most sophisticated bank heist in history, one that would eventually span 40 countries and steal nearly $1 billion. They didn't break into vaults or tunnel through underground passages like traditional bank robbers. They didn't hold anyone hostage or wave guns in crowded banking halls. Instead, they hacked the banks themselves, turning the institution's own systems into weapons that would silently drain accounts for years before anyone understood what was happening. This is the true story of the Caravan Act Gang, a group of hackers who revolutionized cybercrime and showed that in the digital age, the biggest threat to a bank isn't what walks through the front door. And what's most terrifying about their operation is how simple their entry point was, an email that looked completely legitimate. For months leading up to early 2014, banks around the world have been experiencing incidents that seemed isolated and explainable. Small discrepancies appeared in accounts, ATMs acted erratically in ways that seemed random, and IT departments occasionally noticed unusual network traffic. But nothing raised serious alarms, because banks deal with technical glitches constantly, and each incident appeared to be its own separate problem rather than part of a coordinated attack. Then, in early 2014, a bank employee in Eastern Europe noticed something genuinely alarming. The bank's domain controller, essentially the master key to the entire network, was communicating with unfamiliar command and control servers. Investigators found that some of these servers traced back to China, although forensic analysts cautioned this could have been a deliberate false flag meant to misdirect investigators. What was clear was that whoever had access to that domain controller had complete control over the entire banking network, every computer, every account, every transaction flowing through the system. The employee immediately contacted Kaspersky Lab, one of the world's leading cybersecurity firms with a reputation for investigating sophisticated cyber threats. What the researchers discovered in the following weeks would reveal an operation so sophisticated that it seemed almost impossible to believe. The Kaspersky team had uncovered a criminal operation that had been running since late 2013, involving coordinated attacks on financial institutions across multiple continents. They called it Carbonac, named after the malware the gang used, which was based on an older banking trojan called Carburp. The criminals had taken an existing tool and refined it into something far more dangerous, creating a backdoor that gave them complete access to banking systems worldwide. But understanding how they got in was just the first breakthrough. The real revelation was understanding what they did once inside. Every Carbonac attack followed the same carefully planned methodology, beginning with what security experts call the weakest link in any security system, human beings. The hackers sent spear phishing emails to bank employees, messages that weren't the obvious Nigerian print scams that most people recognize instantly. These emails appeared legitimate and professional, sometimes even coming from compromised colleagues' accounts to add authenticity. The subject lines were mundane and believable, invitation, accordance to federal law, or wrong amount. Nothing that would immediately trigger suspicion in a busy employee's inbox. Attached to these emails were Microsoft Word documents or control panel files that appeared to be routine business documents, but hidden inside was malicious code exploiting known vulnerabilities in Microsoft Office, specifically CVE 2012-0158, CVE 2013-3906, and CVE 2014-171. When an unsuspecting employee opened the attachment, the Carbonac malware silently installed itself on their computer without any visible indication that something had gone wrong. But here's where the operation became truly remarkable and different from typical cybercrime. Once inside the network, the hackers didn't immediately start stealing money or causing obvious damage. Instead, they spent months learning and observing, treating the infiltration like an intelligence operation rather than a simple robbery. They installed remote access tools and video surveillance software on administrators' computers, creating an invisible surveillance system inside the bank itself. They watched everything, every keystroke, every mouse movement, every screen that employees looked at throughout their workday. They observed how bank employees processed transactions, how they authorized transfers, how they managed ATM networks. The criminals essentially became students of each bank's unique internal procedures, learning the rhythms and patterns of legitimate banking operations. 
Kaspersky's forensic analysis revealed that on average, this reconnaissance phase lasted between two and four months. Two to four months of patient observation before they took a single dollar. This patience was perhaps their greatest weapon, because by the time they were ready to steal, they knew the bank systems as well as the employees who worked there every day. When the time finally came to cash out, the Carbonac gang employed three distinct methods, each one designed to exploit different vulnerabilities in the banking system. The first method involved phantom transactions. They transferred money directly from the bank's own accounts to accounts they controlled or to international e-payment systems. Because they had spent months learning to mimic legitimate employee behavior, these transactions appeared completely normal to automated monitoring systems. They looked like authorized transfers made by trusted personnel during normal business hours. The second method was particularly clever and harder to detect. The hackers would access the bank's database and inflate account balances before withdrawing the difference. If an account had $1,000, they would change it to $10,000, then transfer $9,000 to themselves. The account holder never suspected anything because their original $1,000 was still there, unchanged and accessible. The bank had essentially created money out of thin air, and the criminals took the phantom balance. The third method involved seizing control of the bank's ATM networks. Using standard utilities rather than specialized malware, they programmed machines to dispense cash at predetermined times. Money mules, recruited through criminal networks across multiple countries, would wait at the machines to collect what investigators later called voluntary payments. The ATMs were essentially turned into automated cash dispensers for the criminal organization. The scale of the operation was staggering and grew more ambitious as the gang refined their techniques. Kaspersky Lab documented cases where the largest single heists grabbed up to $10 million from individual institutions. One victim lost $7.3 million to ATM fraud alone. Another lost $10 million through their online banking platform in a series of transfers that all appeared legitimate until forensic analysis revealed the pattern. And the gang was hitting banks worldwide, not just in one region or country. Russia, Ukraine, the United States, Germany, China, Canada, and dozens of other countries all had financial institutions compromised by Carbonac. According to Kaspersky and Europol's reporting, the operation ultimately affected approximately 100 institutions in roughly 40 countries, with cumulative losses estimated at up to $1 billion. For more than two years, the Carbonac gang operated with near impunity, stealing enormous sums were remaining largely invisible to law enforcement. Banks rarely reported the thefts publicly because the financial industry operates by an unspoken rule. Protect your reputation at all costs. The criminals understood this psychology and always stole amounts just below the threshold that would require mandatory reporting to government authorities, keeping each individual theft small enough to handle quietly while the cumulative total grew into the hundreds of millions of dollars. But in July 2016, they made a critical mistake that would finally give international investigators the breakthrough they needed. The scene was Taipei, Taiwan, on July 10th. Typhoon rains lashed the city as two men, later identified as Sergei Beretsovsky and Vladimir Berkman, both Russians, approached an ATM at First Commercial Bank. They wore hats and anti-pollution masks, which seemed unremarkable in the rain and pollution, but they were deliberately concealing their faces from security cameras. They loitered near the machine for a moment, not touching it, not inserting any cards. Then suddenly, without any input from them, the ATM began spewing cash into the collection tray. They grabbed the bills, stuffing them into a satchel with obvious urgency. As they rushed past an astonished couple waiting in line to use the ATM, one of the men dropped something in his haste, his bank card. That single mistake proved costly. Before First Commercial Bank even reported the crime officially, ordinary citizens had already contacted police about suspicious foreigners collecting large amounts of cash from ATMs across the city. Across 22 branches, 41 ATMs had dispensed over 83 million new Taiwan dollars, approximately 2.5 million US dollars, in a coordinated attack that happened almost simultaneously across Taipei. Taiwanese police acted with remarkable speed. Using CCTV footage from banks and surrounding businesses, they tracked down 22 suspects, most of them Russians and Eastern Europeans who had entered Taiwan specifically for this cash collection operation. Several arrests were made immediately. Others fled, but in their haste, they left behind crucial evidence. Police raids on safe houses recovered large amounts of stolen cash along with laptops, phones, and documents that connected this Taiwan operation to a much larger international organization. The investigation had finally caught a break, but it revealed something even more concerning. This wasn't just one isolated gang. It was one cell of a massive international criminal organization with sophisticated logistics, international recruitment networks, and operations spanning multiple continents. The Taiwan arrests provided crucial intelligence that had been missing for years. Europol, the FBI, Spanish police, and cybersecurity firms began coordinating a massive international investigation pooling their information and following the money trails that the Taiwan cell had inadvertently exposed. In 2016, investigators noticed the gang evolving their tactics. 
Knowing that Carbonac malware was now well known to antivirus software and being actively hunted by security researchers, they developed a new and even more sophisticated threat called Cobalt. This new malware was based on Cobalt Strike, a legitimate penetration testing software that security professionals use to test their own systems. By adapting legitimate security tools for criminal purposes, the gang made their malware even harder to detect and distinguish from authorized security testing. For nearly two more years, investigators followed the money. They tracked Bitcoin transactions through multiple exchanges, monitored safe houses in various countries, analyzed malware code for patterns and signatures, and built a network map of the organization. The investigation required cooperation between law enforcement agencies in dozens of countries, each sharing pieces of a puzzle that slowly came together. Then, on March 26, 2018, Spanish police made their move in a coordinated operation that had been months in the planning. The location was Alicante, Spain, a coastal city on the Mediterranean. Officers arrested a Ukrainian national identified publicly only as Denis K., the suspected mastermind who had orchestrated the entire operation from the beginning. According to Europol's official statement, he was the head of the organization, the person who had coordinated attacks across 40 countries and managed the complex money laundering networks that made the stolen funds disappear. The investigation revealed shocking details about how thoroughly Dennis Kay had covered his tracks. Spanish press and investigative reports later linked him to significant Bitcoin holdings, with some outlets reporting figures as high as approximately 15,000 Bitcoins, which would have been worth about $119 million at the time of his arrest. These figures appeared in press coverage, though they weren't uniformly confirmed in every official release from authorities. What investigators did confirm was that Dennis K. had used financial platforms in Gibraltar and the United Kingdom to load prepaid cards with cryptocurrency, which he then used to purchase luxury vehicles and homes across Europe. He operated a massive Bitcoin mining infrastructure that served as a sophisticated money laundering mechanism. The stolen funds were converted to cryptocurrency through exchanges in Russia and Ukraine, then passed through multiple wallets and mixing services that made them nearly impossible to trace back to their origin. The arrest represented a major victory for international law enforcement. As Stephen Wilson, head of Europol's European Cybercrime Center, stated at the time, this global operation is a significant success for international police cooperation against a top-level cybercriminal organization. The arrest of the key figure in this crime group illustrates that cybercriminals can no longer hide behind perceived international anonymity. Even with the leader arrested and multiple members of his organization in custody across several countries, the story doesn't have the clean ending that people hope for in crime narratives. A large portion of the estimated $1 billion was never recovered, and according to investigators, the Carbonac operation remains one of the most profitable cybercrimes in history. The money vanished into cryptocurrency exchanges, offshore accounts, and cash transactions that left no traceable records. The gang's methods have been studied and copied by countless other criminal organizations who saw the blueprint and recognized its devastating effectiveness. Spearfishing for initial access, patient reconnaissance lasting months, and mimicking legitimate employee behavior to avoid detection have become the standard playbook for sophisticated bank cyber heists worldwide. The Carbonac operation proved these techniques worked, and that proof inspired a new generation of cybercriminals. What made Carbonac fundamentally different from previous attacks was their target selection. Earlier cyber attacks focused on bank customers, stealing credit card numbers, login credentials, and personal data from individuals who had accounts at financial institutions. Carbonac went straight to the source and bypassed customers entirely. They became the bank, operating from within its own systems with the authority and access of trusted employees. They didn't need to steal from thousands of individual accounts when they could steal from the bank itself. As cybersecurity expert Kevin Mitnick observed, even after 20 years, social engineering is still the easiest way into a target's network and systems, and it's still the hardest attack to prevent. You would expect the finance industry to set the bar very high and have employees trained within an inch of their lives not to fall for such an attack. That observation captures perhaps the most sobering lesson from the entire Carbonac operation. The entry point wasn't a sophisticated zero-day exploit that required years of research or some Hollywood-style hacking that involved breaking through layers of military-grade encryption. It was a Word document attachment in an email that looked completely legitimate and professional. One careless click from one employee, in some cases using a personal infected computer to log into their office's network, and that's all it took to give criminals access to hundreds of millions of dollars across multiple institutions. According to Europol's ongoing monitoring, 
groups using similar tactics continue to operate in the shadows of the international financial system. The malware evolves with each passing year, as programmers refine the code and add new capabilities. The techniques become more sophisticated as criminals learn from each other's successes and failures, sharing knowledge through dark web forums and encrypted communications. And somewhere right now, another phishing email is being crafted with the same patient precision that made Carbonac so devastatingly effective. Another bank employee is about to receive what looks like a legitimate document from a trusted colleague, and with one click, they might open the door to the next billion-dollar heist. The question isn't whether another attack of this magnitude will happen, it's when, and whether the next generation of cybercriminals will be as careful as Dennis K and his team were before their critical mistake in Taiwan gave investigators the opening they needed. Dennis K awaits trial in Spain, facing charges related to one of the most sophisticated criminal operations in modern history. His co-conspirators remain scattered across the globe, some arrested, some awaiting trial in various countries, others still at large and possibly still operating under new names with new techniques. The investigation continues across multiple jurisdictions, with new connections and money trails still being discovered years after the initial arrests. The technology continues to evolve, security measures improve and banks invest billions in cybersecurity infrastructure. But the fundamental vulnerability remains unchanged, because in the end, the greatest weakness isn't in the code or the firewalls or the encryption algorithms. It's human. And that's a vulnerability that no matter how much technology can completely eliminate.